My braid is flashing bird. No quarter. I am going to be a hot, comfortable, and hollow <laughs> from start to finish. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Outside of the Box. And today we have a STEM Spotlight episode. And you may wonder why I have bugs in my background. And that is because today I am talking to Ali Moore, um, who is the founder of Bugable. And a lot of that has to do with eating bugs, um, which is surprisingly a cool and pretty widely, you know, accepted concept in a lot of places. So I'm excited to talk to you about this, Allie. Thank you. Yeah, that was the, the kindest intro. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it's it, it's something that I think it can be challenging for a lot of people to talk about and think about. Um, but there's a lot of interesting points that I want to get into that may change some minds about that. And I think this is a really good topic, especially with the National STEM Challenge entry period going on right now. And there may be some students out there who are thinking about these projects and might not have considered that this is, you know, a really great option for a project. Um, kind of tell me about how you got into this in the first place, because I don't think most people just wake up one day and say, hey, I think eating bugs would be a good idea. <laughs> yeah, especially not me. Um, as you said, my name is Ali Moore, and I have a blog that has expanded into now my full-time job um, about insects broadly, I'm actually afraid of it, live bugs. So I say that just to kind of drive home the point that if I can do this, truly anybody can. Um, to be fair, I eat chicken and I think I'd be afraid if a chicken was to run at me, you know, I wouldn't know how to handle that either. So I, I think it's just different people have different comfort zones. Um, and it's really fun to push the limits of your comfort zone because that's how growth happens. Yes, that is very, very true. Um, it is challenging to shift people's perspectives, but there's a lot of reasons why I think if everyone thought about it more deeply, they wouldn't see it as such a barrier. And I say that because when you look at things like, you know, that we already eat bugs. Um, we don't know that we do, but it happens. Um, and it, I think it's just the matter of knowing that you're doing it. And I, I think it's interesting that you mentioned chickens, for example, because if I was staring a chicken in the face, like if I was looking at a chicken like beak or something, I would be like, no, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> but like when you eat, you know, normal meats like proteins, you're not looking at an animal, you're looking at a piece of meat. And I think we tend to disassociate that and say, oh, it's it's not the animal, like it's just meat. Um, do you think that when people think about bugs, maybe that is part of the barrier is they're like, I don't want to just put a cricket in my mouth. <laughs> a thousand percent. I, I, you asked how I got into this and I think it was my inner child coming out and just really diving in head first and getting curious about it. Um, I, cognitive dissociation is huge, um, more so in America than in other countries. And when I was traveling in Mexico, I had seen a sign, Tacos de Chapulín. And I was like, that sounds good. And in Mexico, they don't try to hide what you're eating, I noticed. Um, the signs may be for language, but the signs for taco stands just had pictures of uh, the animal that the meat came from next to the word. So if, if you were ordering chorizo, you know, it had the pig, or if you're ordering estada, it had the cow. Um, and so next to Chapulines, it had grasshopper. Uh, and those tacos were delicious. And that's what that's what sparked it for me was I was just playfully interested in a dish that was delicious, Googled a little bit and found out that they were super nutritious. And America was just really behind the times in terms of offering this protein source and or accepting it. Absolutely. I think my one of my few experiences with even watching somebody eat something that was bug based was going to like a state fair, and they had scorpion pizza. And it was more one of those situations of like, I dare you to get a scorpion pizza, I bet you won't eat that. Um, and then, you know, then the person ate it and was like, this is actually pretty good. Um, so I think it might surprise people. I mean, a lot, a lot of it, I'm sure is 
with the preparation, you know, as just with any kind of food that you eat, with the right preparation, it's probably going to be pretty tasty. Oh, yeah. I'm so curious what state fair, because scorpion is the lobster of the land, and that can taste really good. You know, if you season it correctly, uh, can sear it, a little bit of olive oil, some lemon. It's like um, got a shrimpy, crabby quality to it. So not too bad. You'd be surprised it was in Indiana. Wow. Yeah, I'm really <laughs> curious. Yeah, sign me up. I haven't even had scorpion pizza. That's amazing. Yes. Um, it was certainly surprising to me. I think they also had mealworm pizza. Like they had a couple of different options, but it was just like, okay, they're going to do it for the shock factor. But I mean, if that gets people to try it, then I don't think that's such a bad idea. Yeah, that's, I mean, you bring up the shock factor and that's a huge thing that we're trying to navigate through right now. We like the insect industry, um, because raising awareness is about getting people's attention, doing something maybe crazy like scorpion pizza or bug and wine pairings. But after you have their attention, you have to be careful to not other the food. Um, and, and that's for more of like a cultural respect angle that there are so many people out there that have eaten insects for you know a while in their culture, thousands of years, hundreds of years, or recently. And since food's so emotional, we want to be respectful of those that currently do this practice. But on the other end, we want to make sure that it doesn't end up, insects don't end up as a novelty food that are, that's sold on gas station counters only, you know, lollipops with scorpions and like, oh, how cool. But we want it to become so normal that it's, that it's just not worth remarking about. Absolutely. Um, now it's interesting because the, the national STEM challenge is for grade six through 12. And I think that that is the age where kids start to be more open to trying other foods. I think most of us, when we're kids, we tend to be a little bit pickier. I think, you know, I definitely was. So it may be the perfect like age range to get these kids thinking about this, like, hey, this is something that we could try. Um, I mean, like you said, it is a very sustainable food source. And there is in fact a category in the challenge specifically for future foods. Absolutely. I think you nailed it. The unless we're talking about toddlers, you know, they might be eating things off the ground, whether we want them to or not. Beyond that, um, you get into critical thinking mindsets, and this is why the future belongs to kids. And this is why we hope that kids will be building the future and becoming more empowered to do so. Um, the purpose of the National STEM Festival, the first ever one launched in this way, is to encourage students from a diverse set of backgrounds to submit projects that have world-changing potential. And uh, I think that is so, it's so important to empower these kids and to let them know that you can have an impact. You should have an impact. The future needs to be built by the people who will be living by it, in it. And the future is diverse. And so should our STEM talent be. It's not currently that way. And so we're hoping that the STEM festival really broadens the, the STEM horizon. Absolutely. Um, and I think that this is such a perfect thing because when you're talking about making big changes in the world, I know one thing that comes up all the time, even in America, which sometimes is crazy to me, is just like instability of like not having food and stuff like that. Or but the food insecurity, I think, is the term that I'm looking for. And, you know, there's so many people in that situation. And it's like, there's this other source that we're not utilizing. And, you know, it, that that's a great way, you know, along with a lot of other options as far as foods like community gardens and stuff like that to try and help those folks who are food insecure to have choices available to them so that we don't have, you know, people that are going hungry. Absolutely. The, you know, in addition to being great uh, nutrition sources themselves. Insects are also a key, I believe, in the whole picture of our food future, how to make the food system more resilient, more uh, biodiverse, more sustainable. Like, how do we actually do these things? There's a lot of talk about closing the loop on food production, but what does that mean? Well, to literally do that, we have to look to mother nature and see that we scaled up so many parts of modern agriculture, but in a line. We extract nutrients from the soil, we don't put them back in. And, you know, we don't have nature's technology at work, biofiltering out toxins from the land and the water. And we don't have 
nature's landfill uh, replacement, which are insects and mushroom, doing their magical work um, in our current food system. So there's so much room to enhance it. And I think the best place to start is with insects. Um, by inserting insects back into the food system, they can do not just protein and fat production, but this biofiltering, this recycling from low value to high value, waste management. Uh, at that point, it's not even waste. It's just uh, like if a coconut falls in the forest, it's not suddenly a part of this mini nature landfill. There are technologies at work that take that low value biomass into a high value biomass. That's a technical term, but the kids that are interested in this field, I, I just really want to convey how much room for exploration, um, playful growth application of truly anything related to insects. Uh, there's room for that and that's STEM. Yes, it definitely is. Um, and now there are different ways that you can eat bugs. You know, I think, I think when people think of this idea, they're like, about, you know, actually like taking a bug and just putting it in their mouth, which is one way that you can do that. But there's lots of other ways. I mean, especially with the powder form, there's so many nutrients in that, that you can essentially mix up with other foods. And I think that's a great way to get people to be probably more accepting of it. Yeah, it, it's a weird time right now, um, because it's the question of eating bugs has become almost political or certainly political. And I think that's probably the case for the adult generation. Another reason why we're relying on the kids to um, cut through the political nonsense and just build smart things, build creative things, build impactful things that just make sense. Um, that's a, another superpower that kids have is they haven't been conditioned as long as we have to think a certain way or to just repeat the same patterns. And that's why so much innovation comes from um, kids. But uh, Insects are, sure, edible on their own. Uh, many people would prefer them to be powderized, to put into smoothies, which I do every morning, or into protein bars. Um, the gluten-free community could certainly use the cricket powder flour that is gluten-free and incredibly nutrient-dense. And uh, if you don't want to eat the insect directly, I highly recommend encouraging uh, wherever you buy your meat from to feed the livestock insects. So chickens, fish, uh, swine, like these animals all evolved to eat insects. That's what they eat in the wild. And yet it only became legal to feed them insects a few years ago in the US. So there's a huge market gap, so many opportunities to just repair parts of the food system in a very natural, sensical way. And the question remains how to do that. We need, we need a lot more innovation in the space ranging from um, insect farming equipment to insect like production um, to insect vets like we need insect vets those uh, roles don't really uh, they, we don't have them yet so we're hoping to see bright minds that want to apply themselves in these creative ways to jobs that might not even exist yet exactly like you you touch on a good topic because I think people don't even think about the job creation aspect of that you know you're talking about a whole potentially new aspect of the food industry that we don't have right now, at least not in a large scope. Um, so that is one other way that this could be super beneficial. Um, now, I know it's hard to probably think about that for some right now, but I you know, saw some interesting information about how there was a time in this country where eating sushi, you know, essentially eating raw fish, was like people thought that was gross and now there's sushi bars all over the place and everybody eats sushi and thinks it's delicious i mean there's other things even mushrooms is a great example when i was kid when i was a kid my mom would try and get me to eat mushrooms and i'm like that's a fungus like do you know that's a fungus you want me to eat that and now like i put mushrooms in as many things as i possibly can so i mean do you see a path forward where this is normal and people don't look at it as something that's, you know, not good to eat? Absolutely. The, the sushi example is so fun. I'm glad you brought that up because I reference that all the time when trying to explain, yes, things do change. And yes, even something as sensitive as food can change. Um, and in fact, here's how. Lobster is another great one where I think in Maine, um, there's some story about how 
We used to feed prisoners from a state lobster three to five times a week. And that was considered cruel and uh, inhumane punishment. And it had to be restricted. And yet today, lobster is a luxurious uh, delicacy. And you might think, how did that happen? Well, PR and marketing, and that that's it. Like the lobster didn't change. So it's it's it differs um, culture to culture, what we're willing to eat. There's so much room for change. And especially when these foods are actually really healthy for you, actually really uh, resource efficient to grow um, and have other functional benefits that we're still proving out, then you have a recipe for success. And all you need to do is get a little creative, wait a little bit um, and work with the youth. I have this dream of um, Girl Scouts cookies made from cricket powder, you know, the cricket cookie. Wouldn't that be great? That would be fantastic. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I would certainly buy some, uh, but, you know, I, I think that's great. I mean, it's a really good idea. And I think that's why the fact that Bugable is, you know, building that PR for this um, is a, a wonderful way to potentially get people like thinking about it and considering it as an option, um, especially something as big as Girl Scouts, because everybody eats Girl Scout cookies. And it's like, <laughs> Every time there's a new flavor, everybody wants to try it. So like, why not cricket? <laughs> yeah. And some companies do seasonal things. You mentioned sensationalizing. Um, so it still falls under that category. But now that Halloween's approaching, I'm seeing some ice cream parlors with mealworms as a topping option. Um, I'm like, more, please. Like, that's such a innovative, fun way to do it that I guess gets people accustomed to the flavor and people will be like, oh, I dare you like the scorpion pizza. But then once they try it, they're like, wait, that was actually good. Hmm. That's the moment we're hoping to create. And you have to do it in a safe way. But what's safer than ice cream or cookies, you know? Right, right. Exactly. Um, now, one thing that I found really interesting on the website was talking about the dilemma that vegans have when it comes to eating bugs, because, you know, in a in a vegan mind, it's like, no, this is a living creature. Like this is go for, depending on why someone's vegan, of course, because some people do it for, you know, they have to, and some people do it for, you know, like ethical reasons and stuff like that. So what I really want to kind of hear you elaborate on is exactly what is on your website regarding that, that there's actually more complexity to that dilemma than it seems right at the outset. Oh yeah. Um, I love that question just because it is such a tightrope. It's, it's really, it's, it's a challenging question and I love challenging questions, but um, when you first think about like, is, should a vegan eat insects? Your initial response will vary based on where you stand on like how, like what is a soul or like what, what type of suffering counts as suffering that I won't stand for. But the moment I hear where people place themselves, I like to just invite in, I, I have absolutely no authority in this space, um, but I like to invite in questions of like spectrum. And, you know, if if a cow has more of a soul than a, than a, than a chicken, um, if a human has more of a soul than a cow and a chicken has more of a soul than let's say an insect, and that has more of a soul than, uh, well, maybe a tree would be above an insect. Maybe, you know, we have studies that have come out that show that there are response stimuli from tomatoes that get cut off the vine. Trees communicate with each other hundreds of thousands of miles away when there's a fire um, through their root system and through other ways. And so uh, we can kind of see that life is connected. Life is not quite as simple as it seems. It's in fact very, very complex. And we might be looking at it through a very narrow human lens and saying like, that's alive, that can feel pain, that can't. But at the end of the day, um, I think there's a huge difference between suffering um, and needless suffering. Um, you know, we got to eat to survive. So it's just how to do that. And when we have this industrial agricultural complex that uses tons of pesticides and uses a lot of synthetics, um, we are to, if you're a vegan and have to eat your, your meal to sustain yourself, you're going to be eating like a a pretty sizable amount of fruits, vegetables, legumes, other things like that, unless those are literally from your backyard to your table, chances are very high that more insects were killed to get this much produce um, than would be 
eaten by you and a serving to fill yourself. So the equation doesn't even work out. It doesn't matter what people view, what people's spiritual views are, but you're literally saving insect lives by eating insects directly instead of just having them killed for the production of your crops. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. It's just, you know, you can't, I don't think that you can look at anything through a single lens. There's so many lenses that you have to look at these things through and then kind of weigh, okay, like, where do I fall on this spectrum? Um, so it's, it's just, it's really good thought provoking stuff. And that's just something that struck me like immensely when I read it. Um, and I think that a lot of people should kind of you know, consider that. Thank you. And that, that reminds me of just the um, kind of one of the points we're trying to drive home with the national STEM challenge is speaking to how interconnected things are and how, uh, how from different perspectives, every, I mean, everything is STEM, first of all, like if you don't think that you have a science brain or a math brain engineering, uh, look at me, you know, I it started off by eating bugs and I was going to prank my family with that. And it just got me curious. And if that was my first application, like a little fun Thanksgiving prank, that was still STEM. It really put me into this headspace of, wow, okay, what's the, what's the water intensity of this insect? And like, if you grow it, just learning so much and now applying it in a way that's solving some big food system challenges. I, I really hope that kids hear about this challenge and feel like curious instead of anxious, excited instead of uh, worried and, and just, you know, open-minded to the fact that their passion definitely has an application in STEM. If they love music, that STEM music is so math and engineering related. Um, if kids want to participate in the future, uh, anything that makes them curious does have a, does have a home in STEM and, you know, 65% of students uh, in classrooms today will work in careers that have yet to be named or developed. Like that's how, how wild and big the future will be and why we need it to be built and powered by the curiosities. Absolutely. And, you know, you make a lot of good points there because especially when we're thinking about all of these kids that are coming up with these projects, they may be coming up with things that like, we haven't even thought of yet. Um, and I think that's really exciting to, uh, you know, to see that. And uh, I mean, I'm curious for one to see what these projects are, um, especially having kind of those six categories. And I think they're really important categories. Um, what will come out of that? Right. We have the categories. It's cool because they blend together. We have space. We have the future of food, health and medicine, environmental stewardship. Um, what was the other one? Powering the planet oh. and then um, powering the planet and, and tech. And, and these are all related. You know, insects are listed under the future of food, but they are also environmental stewardship. They are also nature-based tech. They are certainly power, um, metabolic energy contained within insects. That's a little heady, but that's the cleanest of all energies. And we want to start tapping into that raw metabolic energy. Um, and then if, uh, if you've watched the Martian, you know, he's trying to grow potatoes that won't happen. People will be eating bugs in space. Like that is absolutely the way to go. Talk about perfect closed loop system that will happen. So bugs fit into the future of space travel too. Yes. Um, yeah, that's that really, I mean, that's the truly like, that's the great thing about this is that because they blend, I mean, the, the kids have so many different options in what direction they can go with this. Um, so yeah, and I mean, there's still plenty of time. You, you have through new, November 12th in order to um, submit these projects. And I mean, I think it's a great opportunity um, because those champions that get chosen get to come to the festival that'll be um, in April of next year. And I think it's just going to be wonderful. Um, I mean, I, I can't wait to see what what those projects end up being. Yeah. And I think the opportunity to be validated um, by current you know, world leaders in these respective fields, you know, having an astronaut review your project, uh, the, the folks that get to go to DC will have a truly um, otherworldly experience. I think it will, it will 
be forever a part of their life story and give them the confidence that they need to know that they do belong in STEM. Um, and for those that are procrastinators or that just don't want to do another project, you can resubmit a project that you've already done. That's huge. Um, you can tweak it and have it be applied to solve a problem that's come up more recently in your community or yeah, even in the country, you know, there's so much happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and these projects are are invited to solve current problems faced by any scale of community. Absolutely. Um, and really one one last question that I have for you is how do you feel like getting to be a STEM ambassador for this? I mean, that's to me, that's huge. Um, you know, it's it's really having that responsibility to be like essentially a mentor in your field. Um, you know, like how cool is that? It it feels like something. Uh, if my heart had a dream, it would be <laughs> this. I was so happy to get the invitation, truthfully, and the reason why I'm double clicking on all these points of like, feel empowered, feel confident. It's because I wish that I had that when I was a kid and when I was growing up, I didn't, I was never certain that I belonged in STEM. And I felt like I lucked into it or kind of like backwards walked, stumbled into it. Um, but now hindsight 2020, I can see it very clearly. Um, and also the insect community is such a loving, uplifting community of pioneers and weirdos and people like me, um, but we uplift each other and remind each other that we're all on this planet together and it's up to us to build the future that we want to see. And even if insect farming or insect agriculture doesn't have the same sheen as like aerospace engineer yet, um, it, it doesn't matter because we're doing something we love that we're curious and passionate about. And uh, that is aligned with our values. And so being able to share that message with kids and to let them know that that's the type of feeling that belonging in STEM can give you and that it can, it can come from something that you are truly passionate about. It doesn't have to fit into like whatever you see in TV as kids results that do an aptitude test. Uh, you know, anyone, no matter where they're from, no matter what they're curious about, they belong in STEM. I, I love that I can pass that message along. Absolutely. Now, I had told you before the interview that I have here some grasshopper salt um, because I always have told myself that if I'm going to, you know, have somebody on, talk to them, like promote this idea, I'm going to absolutely try it myself. Um, so I'm going to try a little bit of this grasshopper salt and I will absolutely uh, put some on my food in the future because um, I think it's it's really cool. So that is um, surprisingly good. I think it has some like chili in there or something. Um, so yeah, that absolutely <laughs> good on food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just dove into the salt. That is the scientific method. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Direct engagement, testing. Yep, just just do it. Um, so yeah, and, and the great thing is is for anybody that's watching, um, you know, you do have a a list of some, you know, suggestions on the website for those that want to try bug products. So get out there, try it, you know, there you go. Um, but let everybody know, you know, where they can follow you and get more information if they would like to do that. Thank you. The best way to follow me is on Instagram or any social media platform. I'm at Buggable, B-U-G-I-B-L-E. And I'll share uh, just updates on what I'm working on, what I'm thinking about, sometimes a blog. And today I'm working on a team at Chapul Farms and we're using insect biology to upcycle would-be waste, save it from the landfill and use it to make animal feed and soil fertilizer instead. So closing the loop, improving food security. And we will be hiring a bunch of people in 20, 30 years. So we want to, we want to develop that STEM workforce. There you go. Yeah. So I mean, for, for people that are watching, especially for the kids and stuff, you know, get involved in this national STEM challenge, um, try bugs, you know, support food sustainability and all of that. I think it's, it's just such an important thing 
um, in our world today. Thank you. Yeah, I can't say that enough. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, well, for everybody that's watching, um, you know, keep doing so. Um, I want to definitely have more of these STEM Spotlight episodes because I think that they're so important, um, you know, and, and get some more folks on to talk about these really important things. So please make sure that you like, subscribe, follow all of that good stuff. Um, you know, thank you, Allie, for being on and we will see everyone next time on the show.